Making a life worth living and a retirement worth having is really about producing good work in the world. And sometimes it's not always easy to tell people about our faith. When we practice our faith, we literally look to the heavens and we pray to God for things that we long to have happen in our lives. But sometimes we don't get why those little things don't come to pass. The truth is they may have already come to pass, but we sort of missed it because we are looking for it in a different place or in a different person or in a different situation than it literally came into being. In my lifetime, I've seen many times when people literally just miss the opportunities that God was putting in their place. The other day, I literally was at a Kroger store, which is a grocery store in our area here, where a man was collecting cans for another man who was ill and immobilized, and he was literally taking those can tops and pulling them off and taking them to a Riley's Children Hospital to produce some revenue for that facility. Within about three minutes of the man departing, a woman drove up with about six garbage bags full of cans. He just missed another amount of money in just a few seconds of time because he didn't pause and say, Lord, is it time for me to depart or will someone else be coming along in a few minutes that I might receive some cans from for my project? You see, it's little moments like that we miss all the time. I literally have seen it many times when people are on first dates and they might sit and talk for hours, but that hours of long of talk might actually be timing a person out of the interest in that situation as opposed to timing themselves into that situation. You see, many men and women are looking for those life partners, those people who will make us feel like we are more than ever the fortune of their lives. But how do we find that individual? Have we shared our hopes and our dreams and our little prayers to God for that individual to come into our life, to take up the slack where maybe another has left off, and to produce for our life a lifelong love that will never die, no matter how old we get, no matter how ill we may become as we age, and literally no matter what happens in life, that we will always stand firm together in coupleship, in partnership, in parenting, in whatever the the idea that the Lord has for our lessons of life comes to pass. You see, when we don't put it together like that, we might choose literally the wrong person. And that relationship might last for only seven years or it might last for 20 years. And then we discover that that person and and us are not really equally yoked. But the people that might be just right for us, the people that God might have put along our path to pick up the slack, to take over where someone dropped off and maybe just maybe came into our lives before the other person departed so that we would have a smooth transition, we might have totally missed because we were literally looking for it in someone else, something else or some different life form else, if you know what I mean. See, practically, we tend to be led by our physical eyes as opposed to the souls of our mind's eye. And that's something that we have to kind of put in covenant with God. You see, we might make these little pacts with God that if the man is who I'm supposed to have, then he will have X, Y, and Z, or he will carry these sorts of things, or these will be the secrets that I'll make between my Lord in heaven and myself on earth. So I know that that individual has been sent by God to love only me. You see, sometimes we totally miss those men and women because we're so busy looking for it somewhere else. Now, I talk about these things with some experience because I know a little bit about that. I literally was in a love relationship for almost 20 years, but we had some great moments and we had some struggles. And in about the 18th year, I literally prayed to say, Lord, if this is not precisely where you want me to be right now, going forward into my late years of life, then please allow things to come to pass in a way that makes the most logical sense for us both. And lo and behold, by year 19 and approaching year 20, she literally decided to return home. But what I didn't quite expect was the fact that she decided not to come back to where I was. And a long period of old couple ways got lost. Now that's my story, but what is your story? You see, everyone has a love story of their life. I literally thought that that girl was my love story because of how we met how kismet it was, how wonderful the romance was, how great the early days were, how wonderful it was to have a son by her through that little situation and to parent and to handle all the challenges like any other man would 
with a difficult wayward child who really wasn't of my own loins as a stepchild, and that was tough for him in a foreign country. But openly he matured and he came out okay with our tough love and with us doing biblical principles in our life, even though my gal was Buddhist. And I sort of had to learn some of those rituals in order to be in a pleasant relationship, both in New Year's and at the holidays around the nation, or, or excuse me, around the year, that were a part of the Shintoist or the Zen culture of Japan. Now, that doesn't mean that it's any less holier than the Christian holidays. It just meant that we respected them all. We honored the lives of the people who passed before us in both cultures. And that was something we did, even though she had already gone back home. She was honored in my family when my father passed. And I wanted that liaison to be clear, that my father had a Japanese grandson. Even though he was sometimes not treated quite as well as the others, or the, as the redheaded stepchild is often referred to in a lot of people's families, but that's not fair to say to redheads. But it is how we culturally talk about those situations of the black sheep of the family, if you will. But he wasn't quite one of those. I'm telling you parts and story because I really want you to see that human beings have these little hiccups, that we literally choose the wrong partner and then we completely miss the right one because we're expecting that partner to look a little bit like the old one or to be something so new and different that we totally miss who God planned for us. Then we get into a new relationship too quickly and it turns out to be totally the wrong thing for us and our children if we already had them with our first partner. You see, in life, life is about lessons, and there's a lot of high moralistic people who say, well, you shouldn't have married in the first place, or how can you get a divorce? But in truth, we don't literally have the same ways as we once did of the old ways in the Bible. We've sort of transitioned away from uh, beheading the calf and doing all sorts of things that today would be considered barbaric. We literally don't drink goat's uh, blood, and we certainly don't sprawl a dead animal across a, a altar unless we are practicing in satanic arts, which most of us don't like because we haven't understood that the lighter versions of that is really a way that God is saying, choose me over that, please. But I'm just giving you opinion. I'm no authority on those things, and the Vatican far knows more great deal about those things than we would ever like to know, I'm quite sure. Someday I'd love to, to stroll those um, aisles of the old ways and to see the beautiful books and the history of our world and of the Lord, but we don't often get that right because we haven't gone through the rites of becoming a priest. But that's just a story of my life. I'd like to see the Chinese wall and other things, but right now China and America are not getting along too well. So going to see Tiananmen Square just isn't really going to be a possibility for me or the wonderful soldiers that I love to, to see in books that were made of stone to help to scare away a little army of old. You see, long ago, Japan and China would fight a lot, and they would often lose to Japan because they didn't quite plan well enough. And there's some wonderful stories that we learned through Confucius class and other sorts of stories of history, but I'm talking about things I've learned. But in your life, you've learned a lot of different things about the Lord, about faith, about religion, about spirituality, and about how your life journey has unfolded in your own faith walk, your own prayers of late and of the past. What came to pass, what literally didn't, what lessons you learned, and mainly what magic of the Lord you experienced and what mayhem of people you've gone through. You see, in life, life is really about the magic of the Lord and the mayhem of the people that we surround ourselves with. You see, sometimes the people we choose in life are not the right people for us. And sometimes the exactly right people are people who make us feel like it's mayhem. But that's not true because we've not set our mind on the Lord. And when our mind is set on God, on how do I honor God in this moment, or how can I make sure I'm following the path that God has placed me on for my own life lessons away from other people who are doing harm to my name or literally hurting someone I love or care about, that's something else entirely. You see, in life, we have moments of time to make a difference. I'm thinking today about a man that I tried to literally give a little bit of food to, not a lot because he's a prideful black man and I've seen him a few times already on my path. Last night, I actually was not sleeping very well, so when I was out and about eating the late night leftover Chinese food that a friend of mine had given to me for a lovely evening of talk and conversation and food, I literally saw him looking through trash cans for food and other things. I realized how thin he was the first time I met him. He refused the food I did not want to eat that I purchased of my own accord and my own making. 
He didn't really realize how close I was to his life, but I simply saw a man in greater need than myself. I saw how his pants were belted up so tight that they were literally too big for him, and I literally saw the impoverishment in his face and in his eyes, and how he talked so loudly, maybe needing hearing aids, not realizing he was shouting when he talked, or he might literally have a little bit of a special imped impediment that has occurred late in life. It's hard to say, but when I saw him today, Lord God said, give him this bag, say these words. I didn't quite say the words the way I was supposed to. See, I heard them, but I didn't memorize them, and I'm sort of horrible at those things, unless I'm really clearly on the path I'm supposed to be on. And he refused the bag. It only had a handful of chocolates, which I can't eat with peanut butter, and a few mints, which might have helped him, and some water, and a little bit of that sort of thing that I literally would not partake of, because it was not something I procured on my own is not the point. It's that it just wasn't a right fit for my body and my type. But it was something gifted to me, and the Lord always says, pay it forward, pass it on. And in my life, that's what we do. My mother taught me that. Pay it forward is what my parents often said to their children, that their generosity, their faithful planning of my father has allowed many wonderful things in our lives. And when I would say, I'll pay you back, Dad, he would always say, no, no, just pay it forward. And he was a man like that. He did a lot of things in the community. He produced an amazing statue that a lot of people compliment through his volunteer work in his senior years. And he openly did a lot of generous things to young impoverished children in the Indianapolis area, mostly unknown to them. He just would write a check and would send it over. And he would do this because he planned his money well. He planned his vacation time from the old ways of seniority in a in great company that he literally worked for for 40 years of his life. And that's just part of his story that I really shouldn't be telling you. But if you're listening to me, then you're interested in me or you're interested in my family or you're interested in the life story that God is going to share with me through the pre preaching and teaching or whatever you might like to call sharing kind of a lecture, ideology or monologue or even a dialogue about God and its magic that I've experienced during the last three years since some wonderful individual taught me something about a faith practice. Once I started began to use that faith practice, it literally transformed my life. I've had so many magical moments, but I've also had many mayhem moments from the people that I was put on the path with. Some of them completely failed the Lord in those moments. They literally only thought in their mind. They didn't reflect. They didn't take time to prayer. They didn't say, Lord, what should I do in this moment? How should I help? How should I serve? How should I be godly in these moments of time with this individual? But that was their choice, and they literally took free will. But when I talk about these things, there's going to be people in the scientific community who's going to say, this individual's not well, this individual's foolish. And yet we also have another scientific medical community that says that people of faith heal faster stay more sound in their mind, more robust in their life and in their physique, and literally take time to care for animals and plants and things of the world that are important to our life and the cycle of life that we live in. You see, America is the greatest producer of food, and we really need to remember that, that our food that we produce in Indiana literally feeds hundreds of thousands of people through its production by farmers and the loving, tending hands that care for us in that way. When that food runs out, when the farmland is all given up to houses that are too big for anyone to really live in successfully in old age, it's kind of amazing that we don't realize how valuable the land is. Foreigners come here and totally get it, and we have to be very careful of who we allow to take over land in this area. It's very clear to me that there are some tensions that really are taking over land, not just for their own use of land, like an old way of doing it in the wild, wild west, but for the impact on our land that we have to be careful about. I'll talk more about that in another Mayhem cast, but this is really about the magic of the God that I love, that hopefully you love, and that whatever you might call Lord God in heaven, whether it be El Shaddai or any other historic name from your religious faith or your practical faith practices, that you literally understand who he or she or it is in your life, and how magical the moments can be if you open yourself to listening, open yourself to meditating like Jesus did, and open yourself to hearing what God wants you to do in any moment of time. You literally can be led into some amazing experiences, even if there's some of them harsh. You sit back and you go, wow, that was an incredible lesson, God. Thank you for that moment of time. No matter how good or how great or how ugly or how difficult those moments can be, they are always proven 
for something else later on. And that's what's amazing about living in the light of the Lord. Now, when I talk about the light of the Lord, what do you think of? Do you think of sunlight? Do you think of the sun as an S-U-N? And a lot of people then use this the analogy of S-O-N for Jesus. But openly, that's just pastor talk. What we're really talking about is how do we light up other people's lives? I know I light up like a Christmas tree around one individual. I've never felt this way about any other human being in my entire lifetime. And she literally lights me up like a Christmas tree. Now, my old loves, of course, lit me up. They certainly made me glow with love and feelings and warmth and all sorts of things and warm fuzzies. We had warm fuzzy moments for sure when I knew God was in those moments. But it's not quite the same as the one that you meet that it's like no comparison to. You don't realize that because you don't always have a comparison point if you find the one early on like some people do, right out of high school or junior high or in my parents' case, they knew each other since elementary school. Were they the perfect match? Hard to say. But I know my father adored my mother, and I know she tolerated my father, and openly that was the common family joke. But they really did love each other till the very end. And even now, mom doesn't want anybody else, even though she enjoys companionship of other people and talking. Now, when I'm talking about loving for a lifetime, I'm talking about a lot of things. You see, loving for a lifetime is so different than passionate loving and love making that people sort of forget about those things. But I'm not going to go there because Christians get all offended if we talk about intimate things, which is sort of inappropriate because it's totally in the Bible. We just don't totally get it all because we're not wise enough or because we don't have mature people like the Jewish faith does to give us the information we really need to know to make sure that our love making is always maturing and growing and more essential with each passing year. But that takes loving the soul. You see, the soul never dies. And that's something we have to really understand, that the soul is what transcends and literally goes off to heaven. The body withers and fades away in old age, in the aging of cellular cells in our body, which is literally why I sell a cellular science to kind of prevent and slow down the aging process to sort of help with, if at all possible, disease prevention. prevention. But in truth, I can't sell you on that factually. Under quality controls, I can never say that our product will pre prevent or cure any type of illnesses or ailments. But what we do know statistically is that it helps a lot. And it helps a lot of people to feel stronger, better, more energy, and other little things. But that's just common gossip talking. But we do have some scientific facts that say it does reduce oxidative stress by 40% in 30 days. And those literally come from the scientific minds of the world. Lots of them around the country and around the international world and global marketplace have reviewed this science that it's all based on. It has multiple patents across several now countries and openly that means a lot to me as a scientific oriented mind. Now, am I selling that to you? No. Am I suggesting you take a look at it for your own well-being and your own preventive maintenance is what we used to call it in manufacturing, where you're trying to prevent illness or prevent things from occurring. And we can't even promise that that'll do that. But it might slow some things down. It might really help. You don't really know. It's kind of like vitamin C. You can't tell totally that you've just taken vitamin C. But what we do know is that you can't eat enough berries to do what this one little pill can do in one pill a day type of, uh, of programming. And literally, for how cheap it is per month, it makes no sense not to take it. That's what my father felt when he saw the plan, and he's seen a lot of things in his lifetime before he passed away. Now, I'm not selling you one thing. I'm just literally saying, if you like anything that I'm saying, if you like the authenticness of it, if you like the transparency of my life that I share, if you like some of the comments that I make, if you hate some of the comments that I make, if you find what I'm doing new and different and a little bit off kilter, that's openly okay. Magic and mayhem is like that. The magic of the Lord is something that only you can experience. Other people you can tell the stories to, but they might kind of tilt their head and cock it and go, eh, really? And they might doubt, but you know within a matter of fact, total, excuse me, total totality, let's get the right word out, that you really have the opportunity to show love to people in this world. And sometimes it's God who literally says, do this and they will remember you. Kind of like when we take the covenant, do this in remembrance of me. It's sort of the same thing with people. We try to make sure that they literally remember us when they move away, when they go off to challenges, when they face hardships like divorce, or when they're struggling with, how do I parent alone now that my partner is gone from some sort of transition and I've got children I've got to keep loving every moment of the day and, and time. I literally sent some silly gifts to someone because I wanted her to focus her time on loving her children 
and not worrying about what was going to happen next every single minute. Having some fun with those kids so that she could literally feel the love of the Lord shining through her into those souls and those minds that were growing and heart beating for their mom. But not everyone gets that message. Outsiders can lie and say, oh, this is odd, this is weird, this is strange. And that can totally destroy the loving thought that was put into those purchases of those little gifts, those extra things that I normally sent to my marketing clients. I just added a few extra to make sure the kids wouldn't fight over the one mom got in the mail as a part of being a client in my programming. But I really loved that gal. I loved her deeply, profoundly, and I will never say anything other than that. No matter how harsh she might get, no matter how hard life might be sometimes, I love one individual. Now, did I not love people before? Sure. But have I loved someone like this ever in my life? Never in my entire existence have I ever felt like this about any soul ever in the world. Now that's sharing a story. Now what about your love story? What about your love life, which is in my business, but openly you've got someone special in your life, maybe. Or you're looking for that someone special and you're trying to figure out, is this the one God? Is this the right person? Well, that's where my faith fob practice comes in play. You see, I literally know what to eat for my body when I stopped thinking in my mind and started listening to God saying, that can is better for your body than that can. That price over there is cheaper than that over there that you're thinking of purchasing. And when I started living my life like that, the magic just unfolded like gangbusters. You see, the angels around us are totally around us, not only in human form, but also in spiritual form. And I don't have to be odd or, or, or mentally unwell to tell you this. I literally can show you the energy of the Lord if you believe in God. If you believe that people's stories about how they were rescued or saved in accidents and how that individual that was there was then gone in the next and nobody can figure out where they went. Have you not ever seen an angel in your life that looked so surreal as a human that like there's no way that person's human? You see, that's what happens in the world. And the Lord creates many things, many wondrous things, according to many of the songs of old. And openly, we've gotten away from respecting all tenets of the Bible. Every little faith has angels listed. They also have satanic forces noted. But we also have to recognize that if God made it all, he made that force to challenge us, to force us to decide to love in response to difficulty to force us to forgive, which is sometimes hard when the people who harmed us are people we loved dearly. It's also right for us to set boundaries for people who literally violated our rights, but we have to determine, did they really violate our rights or were they trying to tell us something important and we just were unwilling to listen at the time? And is it possible for us to make amends? Is it possible for us to repair relations? Is it possible for us to go forward and say, gosh, I'm really sorry I made a mistake in these things and I failed you completely? but I will do whatever it takes to make it up and make it right because I love you and I love your soul and that's what matters in life. You see, when we take the time to talk like this, it's really different. But if we're so mad that we can't see straight, that's one thing. But if we're practically mad because it violated our rights, it ruined our legal name, it destroyed our finances, it ruined our credit, that's a different type of mad. That might be a rage, that might be a lividity, but openly we have the right to feel those things because God made those emotions within us. It's what we do with those emotions that make the most sense. Some people just say, talk to the hand, and they're too immature to have conversation and try to make amends. Other people literally say, I'm sorry, you violated my rights, you put me at physical risk, I'm not allowing you back in my life. But sometimes the physical risk comes from the people around us, not the person who we're trying to blame it all on. And that's sort of an interesting story for another day. But openly, I'd like to say this only one time, that in my life, people have loved me somewhat. In my life, I have loved other people, absolutely. You probably have a similar story, that you feel that you love others, but they don't love you back well. That's not really true. People just love in different ways. And sometimes those love grow. Sometimes those loves disappear for a little while and then return into our life to be fully flourishing ways that God has planned for our life. What we have to figure out is, did we keep our covenant to the Lord? Did we say, God, if this person shows up with these items or this these traits, then I will know he was sent by you for me in this world. That's really where we're talking about today is how to make covenants with the Lord so that you know that it's your friend who's doing the right thing versus you. Sometimes we can just whisper a word to the Lord and say, if this person says X, Y, Z, then I'll help then I'll know I'm supposed to help. 
or if this particular animal crosses my path, then I'll know what to do. You see, we miss those signs all the time, and there's a wonderful teacher in the Broad Ripple area who can teach you all about those wonderful, wondrous signs that come to us that teach us lessons of old, and lessons of druidity, possibly, but the truth is it all came from that long before the priests took over and decided to do a marketing campaign for Jesus. And that might not sell well with some Christians, but truthfully, that is factually what happened historically. And you can't say otherwise because it's documented well on earth that that's what happened, that they took some of the wonderful rituals of that earth wish worshiping clan and put that into our present day worship now, including Christmas and other holidays. But I'm just talking based on history. What are you talking about? Literally, if you're just talking about mamby-pamby things, sports, and other things that don't make a difference in people's lives, then maybe you're not with the right people. If you're literally struggling in your career, then maybe you're in the wrong workplace. If you're literally struggling in your relationship, then you're probably with the wrong man or wrong, wrong woman completely. You see, the people that we partner with love us wholeheartedly. No matter how good or bad we are, they love us unconditionally. And they will tell us they love us until we are blue in the face almost to the point that it makes us absolutely ill because they have to know that we love them. You see, love is something we give as a gift. It's not something you take back, but it is something you put a hold on if someone has violated our rights in some way. But it might be right to realize that that hold, that stretch, that difficulty that we're feeling in our soul is really the love buried deep underneath our pain of a breakup or a conversation or a meltdown or something that just didn't go right in a relationship that we long to have back in our lives. I know I long to see someone special, actually two special someones in my life for different reasons. And my prayers have always been that and the Lord knows it. But it's up to them to be mature enough to handle those moments, to come to me open armed, to come ready to hug, to come ready to forgive, to come ready to love, to come ready to say, you know, despite all that's happened, I love your soul no matter what. And that's what we do in our life, is we say, I love your soul no matter what. Why? Because it's the soul that transitioned to heaven who will see again, according to the scriptures. Now, isn't that what we're really talking about in church? How to live our lives in a way that create a life worth living and retirement worth having with the people that we love and cherish the most. And when those people violate those rights, it's harder to cherish them. It's harder to really care whether they live or die. But in some cases, some unique provision of the Lord cases, we literally can't stop loving certain people in our lives. It's just the way it is. In other cases, we might say, you know, I'm going to put a boundary here because I don't want to get hurt again. But we don't know if we don't talk to people. We can't tell if we just throw our hands up and do litig litigational things. But in truth, when someone doesn't hear us say stop, we might have grounds. But the question is, did we go and talk with them in person? Did we try to work things out? Did we do our part or did we just pretend that nothing really happened? Or did we just pretend that it's not right for us? Or do we just pretend to say, I'm not tolerating this anymore? You see, it's that lack of tolerance that harms our lives. 